Welcome to the Drunk Dietitians Podcast, co-hosted by your favorite tipsy registered dietitians, yours truly, Sammy Previtt, co-owner of Dietitians of Palm Valley, and Jenna Warner, owner of Happy Strong Healthy. Us dietitian besties can't stand diet culture bullshit and love keeping it real. Our mission is for all humans to believe that they are made for so much more than chasing a smaller body. We are also here to share with you that food can be fun and pleasurable again. Although we're medical professionals, we are human too. We are not afraid to share our deepest secrets and how years of our lives were taken by diet culture. We started this podcast so no human has to feel alone in their journey towards food freedom. So grab your favorite cocktail and join us for our favorite casual happy hour and expect to laugh, cry, learn, and grow. Cheers. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Drunk Dietitians. We are super excited. We just cheers with wine, and I had a special cocktail that you're just going to have to wait and listen to hear what it is. Um, but today we had Margaret Doherty. Why do I mess that up every time? Margaret Doherty, um, licensed marriage and family therapist on our show today. And it was a really awesome conversation because Margaret and I know each other via Instagram. Um, we have a lot of mutual friends and we met by just having a socially distanced conversation before that was a thing. And <laughs> we talked a lot about um, her story and, you know, what she does and what she has been through and how that relates to what she does in, with her patients as well. And we also hit a lot today about, you know, just working from home, this new normal, this new routine, and what that means from a family and marriage therapist perspective um, with now possibly a lot of people working at home with their significant others like Sam and I are today, um, which is new for both of us. So it was a really interesting conversation, very relevant to right now. Um, Sam, what'd you think? Yeah, just going off exactly what you said, just relevant right now in the aspect of COVID-19, coronavirus, um, working from home. Um, like you said, she shared her story. She was very vulnerable, very open and transparent. I think we had some really honest conversation with her about, you know, really using, I think a lot of what we talked about, what I re am recalling, reflecting on the conversation is just like using food as a coping mechanism or just mm. coping with your emotions of kindness and how to remove judgment and shame and guilt from those um, situations, which is really hard to do. Um, so yeah, I think for anybody that's stressed or has anxiety regarding being quarantined in your home, I think this <laughs> is a great listen, um, for sure. Sure, sure. It's a great listen, and it's so relevant. I mean, hopefully, we don't know when it's actually going to be airing, um, but hopefully this will be behind us when it is on Spotify and all of your streaming platforms. But right now, um, there was a lot that was shared that really can be put into practice today and always just for maintaining a positive attitude and maintaining the gentle acceptance of your scenario and you know working through your emotions and not running away from them which I think is a big one for a lot of us right now so anything you want to add before we hop into it do it all right here we go Hello, everybody. We are back with Drunk Dietitians. For whatever reason, I almost just like stumbled on the name of this podcast, but that just like <laughs> legit flows with where we are today. We are virtual cheersing. Sam and Margaret are drinking wine, and I am drinking um, emergency tangerine flavored in a beautiful wine glass because, you know, times are times. <laughs> so we'll get back to that next. But today I'm really excited. We have Margaret Do Doherty here. I'm thinking Shannon Doherty <laughs> with us today, who is someone I admire so much for her honesty, the way that she shares her life, her world, her feelings, her emotions, and her passion for helping people um, on social media, which is where we were connected through close friends of both of ours. Um, mm -hmm. I think mutual followings found each 
each other and we connected. We have a lot in common. Um, we are able to kind of inspire each other, which I find really amazing. And I'm just super excited to just hear everything about you. Margaret is a licensed marriage and family therapist. And so I'm just the elephant in the room right now. Like it is during the coronavirus crisis that we are recording this episode and there's a lot more families working at home with their significant others. So what perfect time to have yeah. Margaret on here. And kids are home. It's, <laughs> it's yeah. definitely a different type of stress. Um, and it, we're really excited to hear your perspective and maybe give our people, our listeners, some uh, tokens of some nuggets of of happiness today. So Sammy's going to take it away with some this or that, and then we'll get to hear more about you. Sounds good. <laughs> yes. So this super casual, I just want to get to know you outside of like work stuff. Um, just some simple questions. So coffee or tea? Coffee. Coffee. Love it. Um, wine or beer? Wine. Clearly. What's your favorite <laughs> kind of wine? I always love to know like if you could only have one wine for the rest of your life, what would it be? So I'm, I'm a big rosé girl, but okay. what I'm drinking today is Bridge Lane, and they have a white Merlot, and it's Ooh. so good. Oh, okay. I might, if I'm, if the um, liquor stores are still open, I might have to venture out. <laughs> get out and so get it good. before it's too late. <laughs> too funny. Um, tequila or vodka? Tequila. Tequila. All day, Love every it. day. Love it. Same. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sand or snow? sand. Even though I'm Irish and I burn, I am not a happy person in the snow. <laughs> yeah, I'm the same way. Um, Netflix and chill or night out on the town? Well, right now I'd rather a night out on the town. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I was going to say. Gonna say. <laughs> um, yeah. a, a mixture of both, like maybe go out and then come home and hang out. Love it. Love it. But yeah, no, I was thinking, I was like, Netflix and chill is pretty much everybody's like reality right now. So quarantine anything and chill. but that. Yeah, <laughs> quarantine and chill, as people have been saying. Crunchy or smooth peanut butter person? Neither. I hate peanut butter. <gasps> We've never had this answer before. <laughs> this is uh, really? So wait, tell me, do you like almond butter? Nothing. Like no nuts, no peanut, nothing. Are you I, allergic? I have, nope. I will tell people so they don't put it near me. <laughs> I, no, I just, I hated it. As a kid, I was at my uncle's and I thought I was being sneaky and I went to a bowl of candy and I grabbed it thinking it was M&Ms and threw them all in my mouth. And my mom said, somebody better get the pail because they were Reese's Pieces. Uh -huh. <laughs> so that's oh what I get for trying to sneak candy. That is oh so funny. I literally like peanut butter is like my, don't look at my latest blog post. It's like five ways to use peanut butter. It's not <laughs> hard to be healthy and not eat that stuff though. Oh, Everything so is made good. with it. I know. Yeah. I'm allergic to tree nuts. So I feel you in like that perspective. Like there's so many things that I can't eat, but peanut butter is like my lifeline. Okay. I digress. Keep going, Sam. <laughs> No worries. That was a surprising answer. That's not our usual answer. Um, all right. So last one here. If you could have one thing in limitless quantities, but it cannot be money, what would it be and why? For the rest of your life. That's I don't know if I said this that. or that. Lim <laughs> I know. No, no, we changed it. <laughs> Curveball. Hmm. Quality time with people I love. Oh, I love that answer. I think that's a great one. We've had similar answers before, but now more than ever, I think that's a great answer. I think you are realizing them. that like connection is really important and it doesn't have to be face to face because we're all so busy. It's like, oh, I can't text that person. But like you can, we, we have the time and now we really have the time. Everyone's kind of like reconnecting, which is nice. It's the upside to all of this. It's such a beautiful way to think about things. And I think that's what's really been given, giving me a lot of perspective too, is just like the ability to not take things for granted. Like I called my grandma the other day, right? And I, I tell myself I'm going to call her every week. And it was like such a happy conversation. And like, these are reminders of things that we just need to keep doing and connecting with people that need us. Yeah. Um, definitely some good learning things. Before we like get into some craziness, can I just share with you guys what I saw on Instagram right before this? Um, okay. Absolutely. Are you ready? <laughs> so Disney has a movie Tangled. Have you seen this meme? Yes, I read this last night. 
Like, so it's about a girl that's quarantined. It's about Rapunzel, right? And the yeah. town that she lives in, she's quarantined in her home. Her hair grows really long. That's how long she's in her home. Yeah. The town that she lives in is called Corona. Like, <laughs> what? Yeah, that is strange. Like, isn't that insane? And then the Purge movie, apparently the date of the Purge was 32120. Like, something's going on. But anyways. <laughs> Margaret. Is it over by then, then? Is that the next one? It's is tomorrow? It tomorrow? It's tomorrow. It's tomorrow. Okay, so, let's hope. So cheers to kicking off this episode with some hope, a happiness, oh, and God, fun. Oh, God, <laughs> <laughs> But, sure. Margaret, tell us more about you and tell us your story or whatever – that you feel like sharing today, we'd love to know. So first off, I love wine. Um, so that's probably a good place to start. Um, I kind of fell into therapy, like that wasn't my plan. I went to undergrad and was everything under the sun. I took the LSATs. I graduated with an English major and a journalism minor. I had no idea what I wanted to do. And then I was like, all right, I still have to go to school. Fell into a marriage and family <laughs> program and it changed my life. Everyone goes into those kind of things because you have your own family issues. I think most people do. And it allowed me to kind of just like open my world and meet new people and help people in a way that was important rather than just like sitting with my friends and like having conversation. Um, in regards to like diet and fitness, I've been that girl on a diet all of her life. Um, Weight Watchers with best friend and her mom's, you know, elementary school, middle school, high school, and it works and then it doesn't work. Um, but I lost my grandma when I was 16, bunch of family drama, and I ate my way through it. Um, I got up to 260 pounds. And 2008, in the beginning of January, I went into my mom and I said, I'm ready. And I went to Weight Watchers and I lost almost 100 pounds over a couple of years, which is fantastic. But it's hard to stay there. Like life happens. And I think that that's something we forget when we get in the zone and we're in the groove and we're like, we've got this. Life is going to throw you a curveball and say like, you don't got this. Or <laughs> it's going to be a little harder for you to get through this. Um, after I graduated grad school, my uncle got sick. My dad got sick. My uncle died. My dad died in a year span. And food and fitness was actually how I got through it. Like I was at the gym all the time. And it wasn't until like a couple of years later that like I started to gain weight. And I was like, why am I gaining weight now? I got through the death. I did this. I did that. Um, and when I work with people now, I, I do work with couples. I do work with families. I do have a lot of individuals and a lot of female individuals who worry about their body image, who worry about the weight that they're gaining, regardless of what size they are. Like, this is a universal issue. This isn't necessarily just for somebody who's overweight or underweight. I think, like, we're seeing that everyone's kind of unsure of themselves and unsure of how they feel in their body and things of that nature. And I have gone from the highest that I hope I will ever be to the lowest I know I will ever be. Like I got on that scale. It was St. Patrick's Day mm -hmm. and I was the lowest number. And I was like, I'm never going to see that number again. Cause I was going out drinking. I was like 21, 22 and I never did. And I think the, the expectations we put on ourselves and the not accepting where we're at is lost my train of thought is, you know, where things get tricky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as I'm interested, as um, please tell me your title one more time. I don't want to mess it up. It's marriage and family uh, counselor. Licensed marriage and family therapist. Okay. So with working with people with coping mechanisms, I'm interested, you know, I did a, I did a live webinar the other night about like coping with our emotions with kindness. So one of the 10 intuitive eating principles, and it sounds like to me, and I'm talking to like a therapist who's licensed in this, it sounds like to me when you were going through those really difficult times, like food was a coping mechanism for you and, and you were just doing the best that you could, right? It's, there was nothing morally wrong with, with your body, no matter what the number said on the scale, that was just what your body, that was the only thing that you knew how to cope with at that point. Right, which was learned behaviors from family. Yeah. Um, yeah. My mom and I have done this all of our lives, well, all of my life together. And it's more about like, and I'm learning this now, to accept where you're at. And people think when you say like, accept where you're at, if you're 250 pounds, that you like it. 
and that you're okay with it. But that's not what acceptance means. It means mm-hmm. saying like, okay, this, this is where I'm at and I'm in pain or I'm suffering and I have to un- and lean into that and understand that this is part of the journey instead mm-hmm. of avoiding it. So Absolutely. when you, to do the coping mechanisms and get through it, you have to first accept it. And that's yeah. really hard for people to do, to sit with their private events, which is everything going on in their body and their minds and sit with it and say like, this is uncomfortable and I'm not happy and I have to be unhappy. Like we try to avoid it and push it and be like, no, this isn't happening. Like I can get through this day. Like right now we're all in a huge radical acceptance moment of like, hey, mm-hmm. I can't leave my house unless I'm going to the mm-hmm. grocery store or the doctor. Yeah, no, and we had, um. Brie Campos, a body image just therapist made me on think here. Of that. Yes. Yeah, she always she calls it sitting in the suck, and um, and and exactly that. People love to be comfortable. We love to be happy. We love to feel these emotions. So whenever like an emotion that isn't positive comes into play, that they that we try everything we can. We go to coping mechanisms to make us feel better. Um, where I differ a little bit, and it might be different than your practice. I don't know, but with our practice specifically with intuitive eating is I don't really use emphasis on weight at all with someone. So when we say like accepting where we're at, um, it doesn't mean that their body is going to change when they get better. Um, That's not the emphasis at all. So it's interesting just to hear the differences in our kind of, I don't want to say train of thought because it sounds similar, but um, like, do you, when you counsel people, do you say if they're losing weight, that that's a good thing? It's where they want to be. So it it comes down to values and goals, which people also don't always understand. Like goals are achievable things, right? You set a goal, Mm -hmm. if to lose 10 pounds, like you can go towards that. A value is, and I wrote this down so I didn't mess it up, (laughs) it's like an (laughs) ongoing pattern of activity. Like you can't achieve a value. It's just how you live. And everyone's values are different. So somebody may have just learned to have a better relationship with food and not care about the weight. That's how they're going to live a value-based life. Other people need to lose a little bit of weight or gain a little bit of weight to be able to live that value-based life. It's very individual. Like there is no one size fits all. Yeah. No, I I like that approach. And I think that's something with our clients, we always say like weight is not a behavior, right? It's a data point. So we, we know with the determinants of health that our individual behaviors impact about 36% of our health, social connectedness, 24% of our health, which is literally what's going on right now. Like <laughs> a lot of people are struggling is because yeah. we can't have that social connectedness. Um, but so, yeah, it's, it's just interesting. I just wanted, and I hope it's not coming off like I'm arguing you or anything. It's no, not at all. A train of thought that our practice is weight is not a behavior. So we don't, it's not that weight loss is inherently bad. Like I would never, if somebody lost weight through working through intuitive eating, I wouldn't be like mad about it. It's just not our focus and our practice. So it just is a different. Right. And Jenna, you have a, a way, like a different way too. Is it my turn? No, I'm just kidding. I don't no, want, I think, I mean, this is like such a beautiful conversation of understanding, like just meeting people where they are is how I'm approaching or hearing like, the different conversations here too because look at the end of the day the people that we connect and find are people that find our message and want help right and so Mm -hmm. when you connect with people through human connection which a lot of times in 2020 is through a computer and a phone and so we have to continue to use that to our advantage during this time and like continue to speak these thoughts and messages out there and just continue to, to connect with more people i don't use weight as a determinant or a goal, any I should say, anymore in my practice, but I used to. And I understand more now that with a focus not on a weight loss number, so much more beauty can happen. Because typically what has happened in my experience is when somebody gets to that number, whatever that happens to be for them, nothing else changes. And then you look at a period of like right now, like let's think about the people right now that have lost their weight, quote unquote, by going to the gym and doing radical things in the gym for hours and hours on end, like used to be me, right? Their gym was just taken away from them. Their community, their support, their 600 calories burned in a class and let me do it again and again and again and again. That was just taken away from them. And so now 
they don't have coping mechanisms or understandings of options of what to do when that one little piece of their life was taken away, not by choice, but because it had to be, right? And so a lot of what I do now is challenge my clients to like, think about whatever the goal is that you, you want to get to, that's not weight numbered, but wherever you want to be, whatever you want to feel, we need to get there in a way that once you get there, you can stay there forever. And that means if your gym's taken away, nothing else changes, right? So like what strategies can you put in to kind of like, re what is, um, I wanted to say map quest, but I'm like really dating myself by saying that. What does Waze say? Like rerouting route, <laughs> like whatever yeah. that and, is. <laughs> and what I'm hearing you say, like with the gym, like that being taken away, that is probably their avoidance piece. Totally. And that's where the negative behavior patterns come in. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people right now are really sitting in their feelings because they don't have their avoidances. And I, yes. And I keep thinking of myself, like if this happened, if this scenario happened four years ago, three years ago, even that soon, like that early, whatever the word would be, like I would be way less okay than I am right now, <laughs> right? Like way not, yeah. like just, I would not, I would not have any strategies in place to be able to handle the reality of my new life, right? And like, that's a very real thing, I think right now that a lot of people are feeling. And, you know, um, before we started recording, Margaret was telling us that she's doing virtual practice with her clients. There's a lot of people that still can't do that. And like now they're yeah. without all their support yeah. system and it's tough. Are you finding it easier or able, are you able to connect with people in the virtual way in a, do you feel like it's productive, I guess is a, a good word for it. It's doing what it needs to do right now. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do teletherapy. Um, a lot of times I do it with clients that I do see, but I can do it with anyone in New York State, but you lose that connection. Mm -hmm. And I've had clients say to me where like they've, they've gone away or for some reason they can't get in the office and we do it. They're like, I like the office so much better because there is that human connection because we're digging in deep to a lot of things sometimes. Like people come in and they're like pouring their hearts out of like, traumas they've been through or really bad things that are happening in that moment and like they need I think that safety of a different place mm -hmm. so for me for therapy my therapy office is their safe space and they can leave it there where like when you're doing it and the person's in their room they're almost True. Like, I never thought about it like that like it's purging in your room and then like you close the computer but now you're like almost you don't get to leave it hmm. you're sitting yeah. in it more yeah yeah so but for right so now, true. it's just whatever works that people are getting, you know, the things that they need that they don't go into these avoidance patterns again. Um, I use the metaphor, it's like a beach ball, like in a pool. Have you ever like tried to take a beach ball and like push it down to so say like you're really stressed and so you're eating and that's pushing it down. And then the second you let go, it pops back up over somewhere else. <laughs> and then you go, the other side. <laughs> right. And then you go to the gym for three hours, so you push it down. And then it pops up over there. And then you're having two I bottles love of wine. that. <laughs> like it's That's a great only analogy. Mm -hmm. And it's avoiding yeah. equals suffering. And we don't have to suffer. So like yeah. we all have pain, right? Like that's inevitable. We're all we are all gonna feel pain. But when we do the avoidance patterns, that then equals suffering. Yeah. I've lost or physical I've, unpleasantness, right? Yeah. Like with the eating, like that's what, like right. when people are eating, it's not about saying like, bad you, stop eating. It's saying, what are you truly feeling? What's right. going on? And if you are feeling physically unpleasant, being able to separate that from emotionally unpleasant, they could be happening at the same time. But being able to recognize being curious instead of judgmental on ourselves, which is probably one of the hardest things to do. Ever. Right? <laughs> yeah. It's like saying, um, I'm stuck inside, but I just blew my diet because I ate a cookie. And taking that butt and putting the word end. I'm stuck inside, I'm stressed, and I ate a cookie. Because when you say butt, it sounds like you're punishing yourself. That's when so powerful. End, it's just putting the two, th they're existing together. That was, I love that. that's so powerful. Like, Sammy, you need to make a post about that. Like, replacing. <laughs> it's changing, yeah. It's changing yeah. that mindset. 
Yeah, that's definitely so good. The mindset. I can see that though. Like, you know, when things like land for people, like right now I'm picturing the, the beach ball for sure, but like, I can see that switch and like, how beautiful is it to say that out loud and then like take a deep breath? Like I'm stressed and I did this instead of, but and it's okay. it, yeah, and I'm okay with it. I tell people all the time too, like, listen, stress eating is pretty normal because it's just eating, right? Like if you're feeling stressed and you eat lunch, like, is that stress eating? Like, no, you're just eating lunch, right? And so when we talk about that coming from like a stress space, one of my questions to back to people is like, when you finish having whatever you had, it's okay. But I really want you to ask yourself, like, do you feel less stressed after? words and like if you don't what could you be doing in addition to eating if that's right. part of what helps you like to manage that stress so is it like having the cookie and reading the book that's sitting next to me right now and <laughs> eating or is it walking your dog and eating the cookie or whatever it is and kind of like adding on to that it's kind of like adding the and into the sentence that you kind of just said um i don't know how do you feel about that one sam I always, um, so I see a therapist and she's also an intuitive eating counselor certified and she, I hope I don't butcher it and my notes are in my office, damn it, uh, where my husband is right now, <laughs> but she always says, um, pause, process, um, postpone. So hmm. when you're walking into a stress eating situation and she's, like I said, she's a certified intuitive eating counselor. So it kind of comes from Evelyn Tribble's work, but so like, so with your situation, Jenna, it gets, stress eating is tricky because you can be stressed and physically need to be biologically fed at like, or like you might be biologically hungry, excuse me, at the same time. So stress and physical hunger can exist at the same time, mm. or we can rule out the physical hunger and that stress component is still there, right? So by first just pausing, acknowledging where we're at, um then processing so with pausing she talks about different breathing exercises which i'm sure margaret could tell us about because breath is there's such powerful things through breath which i suck at um and then like I i'm horrible <laughs> yes i would love for it to hear more and then the processing um like journaling right so as corny as it sounds sometimes like taking a journal and sitting down and actually like physically seeing what's going on before we do it and then postponing um, from the act of saying okay I'm allowed to have this food I have permission to have this food but I and I know I'm not physically hungry so I'm going to postpone the food and try one other act first so is it a distraction is it calling a friend is it meditating is it getting a glass of water or, or wine or tea and sitting outside on your lanai you know whatever it is um is it going for a walk is it breathing exercises then checking in with yourself and saying okay i still have this intense craving for this food so the pause process postpone um is a big thing that we do with our clients and i would love to hear margaret i'm sure you have like your own kind of analogy or way that you work through that that's really it's interesting because when you were talking about it, I was thinking like personally. So I'm usually pretty transparent that like I deal with anxiety. Um, mm -hmm. It's probably skyrocketed since my dad died. But I think that's when we finally were able to put a label on it. Um, but to say to do those three things, like I tell my clients to do things like that all the time. But when you're yeah. saying in my head, I'm like, right, because right now, like last night, I had like two cookies because I was like, the world is ending. I'm never going to leave my head. Like I spiral. Yeah. And like, yeah. like, and it's good to be in that moment because then when you're sitting with your clients and they're like, I tried and I couldn't, you can really understand that like they probably really did try to postpone. Yeah, absolutely. But like absolutely. so hard. And I often say like I'm sitting with clients and I'm giving them this information and they're nodding their head and I'm like, I know, it sounds really easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's really absolutely. hard. And like yeah. reminding them that like we can give them the tools and they're going to fuck them up probably 75% of the time at first. hundred mm -hmm. percent. And I think the huge so part good. of that is removing that morality, right? To say, it's okay if you ate the two cookies, you are doing the best you can with what you ha have in this situation. It is a coping mechanism and food is always going to be a coping mechanism. That's something I had my group counseling last night, my group coaching. I told them I, I would be doing you a disservice if I said, uh, like, and same to us three, right, that we're never going to emotionally eat again. We're human beings, right? So 
normalizing that sitting with it, like exactly like you said, and I ate the cookies right. and saying, it's okay. And the more we normalize that, it's not surrendering and saying that like, oh, that coping mechanism won and I can never get rid of it. No, it's, it's just still a tool in the toolbox and continuously building more, more mechanisms. It's the acceptance of what is and leaning into it. And it doesn't have to be comfortable and you don't have to like it, but it's what happened. Yeah. It's so good. Oh, I hear some growls from the dog. I might have to go out and mute for a second. He can't even hear us. Um, (laughs) But Margaret, I just want to thank you. I mean, during this conversation, you've shared so much personal stuff. Um, I mean, you're sharing so much beautiful, like actual things that we're, Sam and I are going to apply, but you've shared so much personal pieces of your story. And I just want to first and like acknowledge that and thank you for digging in there with us. I mean, I personally have listened to your Diet Starts Tomorrow episode where you did share a lot of that um, on there with their listeners, which was so amazing. And like really a lot of that really spoke to me um, with just, you know, you sharing your story and how many people can relate to that and the feelings that you shared. So thank you for that. Well, thank you. I think it's important to be as transparent as possible. I mean, in therapy, there are boundaries. Like, you can't be talking about yourself. Like, like all of that. But I would be lying if I wasn't saying that I was a real human. Like, if you come into my therapy office or virtual office, like, <laughs> you're the expert. I'm not. This is your life. You're, I'm with you 50 minutes of a week. You're with yourself all the other time. Like, you have to teach me what your life is, and then we have to work together to navigate it in a way that's going to work for you. Because my 5 o'clock client... And my six o'clock client might have the same issue, but they're dealing with it totally different due to their family history, due to their learned behaviors, and due to like what works for them. And I think becoming human as a therapist is really is what I think is really important. It's not the way I think they used to do it like 20, 30, 40 years ago, but people coming into the field now are like, we are human too. And we're not perfect. And like, yeah, I had two glasses of wine last night, just like you did, because I went <laughs> through the world. And just normalizing it for them, because they come in with such shame. And I'm sure your yeah. clients, too, come with this shame of like, this is where I'm at, and I don't want to be here anymore, and how could I do this to myself? And it's like, okay, but like, you're human. At the end of the day, we're all human. Yeah. My husband and I had like the dance last night of like, should we open the wine? No, we don't. We had it last night. Should we open the wine? Maybe we'll just have one glass. Oh, should we? And I was like, just open the fucking bottle of wine. Open the bottle. (laughs) Oh, I get it. And that's so true. I mean, I think that for me personally, once I started sharing my own struggles is when I actually found the people that I wanted to work with. Um, I worked with a lot of people on on a different level that it was like, this is, it's very, um, like face value. Right. And like, then when I started sharing like what I've been through and that anything you're feeling, I've felt it. Anything you've done, I've done it times 10. Um, and so that's like how now we can connect. It's like, I get it. Like I understand, like, this is exactly where you should be in this process. And here's what's coming next. If you keep going. Um, and I think it's the same with therapy. Like I was going to therapy once a week, a couple, about a year ago. And I've started to like slowly kind of progress that back and it's like one of those things where like you leave and you expect your first therapy session you expect like the world to change right and it's just like nutrition I think the same with dietitians right I'm like (laughs) they expect like what's gonna happen they expect in 50 30 minute sessions or one salad that like the world is gonna change a salad with bonza in it please okay like some sort of carb but you know we expect all these things to happen and then it's like kind of disappointing when it doesn't happen, right? And then you realize like you ha- it's a practice. You have to keep doing it. And I don't know from like a therapy perspective, like how long would you say do you work with a lot of your clients? Like I know personally, like clients of mine that have gone to therapy for 10 years and like they're still going because it's important. <laughs> I think it depends. Um, some people find just comfort in the routine of it. Um, as a therapist, you have to know when it's time to maybe go to every other week then how do we do once? Like, how do we close this? Because then it's, it kind of becomes to a point where it's not working anymore. But when you're dealing with like families and couples, it can be a while. Mm-hmm. I mean, cause those are so layered. Like that's not just an individual, especially when you have a family with like young kids, you're dealing with so much. 
Um, so a year, two years, um, I've been in therapy for, for four, yeah, four, maybe four and a half, but now I go every other week. You know, when my dad died, it was every week religiously, like never missed. And now it's, if I have to miss an every other week appointment, it's okay. And I know what to do to get through into the next one. Um, again, everything is so individualized. And I think that when you look at these fad diets or these meal plans, that is not going to work for 99% of the people that <laughs> get them because it's not a one size fits all. Like you, nothing in life is. No, right. especially now, especially when the options are limited. And like I, Sam, I loved your post recently about like, you know, the foods, maybe I think it was you, something about carbs. I should pull it up that like, you know, why the reasons why we can't, what was it? Why we can't fear them <laughs> is because there are lifelines, oh, especially why now. Be? carb phobic what was yeah. well, actually i had that post created like before like you know i'll do but like batch posts and i don't post them all and it was just like why to not be afraid of carbs and it was like one your body and brain's number one source of energy two they taste fucking good three <laughs> repeat steps one and two but now i mean specifically like looking at our go open that pantry like the box of the pasta the rice the chips the crackers like those are the things that through this hard time like well first of all they've always been in there but I can't imagine for the clients or the potential clients or the people that follow us that have these fears how heightened everything is right now not being able to work out not being able to eat everything fresh not feeling productive all the time even mm -hmm. though social distancing is the most productive thing we can do in this moment right um so that's such a good way to been, put it yeah, one of, I forget, one of the dietitians, I want to say it was the intuitive RD, I forget which one, I could pull it up, but she put something up of like, to all my must be productive people, social distancing is the most productive thing you can do right now. And then, you know, gave some examples, but that was She's my group counseling. <laughs> yeah, right, all of me too. I mean, all of us, I think females in general, um, but to like, you know, that when you feel like it's a go, 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 always be on, always be doing something. And then now it's like, okay, let's go home. Like, we're like, what the hell do we do? Be so, in your home. Um, yeah, being able to be okay with, um, like, and knowing that we're all doing the best we can. That's like the only, that's like on repeat in my head right now. And like having permission to rest, I think is so important. Um, so I like, I'm going to knock on wood over here. Like so far, like I've been doing really well with the coronavirus and it's not because I'm like good at anything. It's just because like Jenna knows I'm not as regimented with my fitness and I eat all the food and I, that these statements come from massive amounts of privilege and um, in different ways. But like, I've been really loving coaching people through this and seeing like where they're struggling and how and then it just shows how like i think our relationship with food and fitness for everyone and our body is being heightened right now because being of challenged so being able to say again non-judgmentally how am i doing right now and being curious to what like what's coming up um so it's been really interesting with our client load it's been and, and for myself and for my husband and just our close friends and family just like watching how everything has been going down. And I think this is going to change relationships and families and how they eat and how they they do these kind of things. I mean, I saw a post yesterday that was like, wow, my significant other does not think about food as much as I do all day. Mm. Because like, he's not going for snacks and I'm looking for snacks every 10 minutes. Like, these are things that you don't see about each other because you go off to work. Mm -hmm. And yeah. not that you're like hiding it, but like you have your home life and you have your outside life. And especially with couples, it's very hard when couples work together um, every single day. And now you guys are stuck in the same house. Like your husband's in your office. Like it, it, it's, it's so hard. And I think we're going to learn a lot about each other. And it's, it's going to cause some difficulties at first. But I think coming together and realizing like, okay, this gives us time to change. What am I feeding my kid at night? Like, okay, I have the time to be home and cook something different. How can I cook this and prepare it that we can have it during the week? Or if your kid sits in front of the TV for three hours because you just need them to be quiet for five minutes with a bowl of potato chips, like that's okay right now mm -hmm. because there, we, we're, gonna be we're okay. so limited in options. And I think couples are probably going to struggle the most during this time. Uh, Did you see 
Did you see the divorce rate in China? I don't know if it was fake, but they were like, it's like tripled like, <laughs> from, from these times. And that's not to like make light of this situation, but like I literally saw that posted the other day because it is like what you just said makes so much sense. Like we are spending more time together than we signed up for. <laughs> right. You didn't sign up to be stuck in your house 24-7 for an unlimited amount of time. Until further notice. Yes. <laughs> Until... right. That's what um, Heather McMahon, one of our favorite comedians, she was doing a whole story about how, like, you're, there's either going to be, like, a shit ton of divorces or a shit ton of babies. And she was, like, doing a whole thing about her husband just kept, like, poking her with her penis in the kitchen. <laughs> Might be super inappropriate, but I don't even care. It was so, she, I mean, it was so fucking hilarious. But she was just talking about how, like, leave me alone. And, like, how all the women are probably just, like, get away. <laughs> right. Wait, there was that. There's that. And then there's another meme that said, like, there's either going to be a shit ton of new chefs coming out of the coronavirus or a lot of alcoholics. There's no in-between. <laughs> like, memes are winning coronavirus. That's, like, the 100%. only thing that has gotten me through. I, memes are amazing. I am literally the meme of the girl that's, like, um, me coming out of the coronavirus with, like, her nails are all grown out. Her hair is a different color. Yes. Her eyebrows are one like, <laughs> like I went on Monday for everything before everything closed. I was like, it gives me a month. It genius. Just gives me a month. <laughs> it's genius. I've been like pumped. I'm like, I'm gonna see how many days I can go without washing my hair or like putting or yeah, putting makeup on. Like I'm just gonna go weeks without makeup and see it's, what happens. It's a really good it's thing. Awesome. It really right? is. Right? So I feel like we can't end this episode without talking about some strategies when it comes to stress and what I, I need to plug, even though I've just made fun of him for like the past 45 minutes, but I need to plug yoga and like the ability to like really to see that practice in work right now, like more than ever. And um, Margaret, last time we interviewed a therapist, we talked a lot. She was a yoga instructor also. We talked a lot about like breath work. And so since that conversation, I've been doing like just a lot of thinking on it and really you know, challenging my clients to do the same. And my husband works in finance and I think it's no surprise right now, like the financial markets are not doing well. Um, and he's also a yoga instructor and he's been on a yoga journey himself for probably close to three years now. And the man is like a fucking marvel in this scenario, like calm and he can speak like fluidly and like really. And I asked him the other day and he said like, thank God for yoga. And it was, he led a, a meditation the other night and he was talking about it um, virtually for his yoga studio. There's like, 50 people on it and I like walked in at the end and I was like almost crying because it was like I couldn't imagine the differences that could be happening and it sucks that he can hear me right now because <laughs> he's home but I couldn't imagine the differences of like what would potentially be happening god forbid like if this was happening without that and so I think there is a lot to say just like what we were saying about one health like one nutrient dense meal versus one therapy session like you expect it to change your world I have a lot of clients that expect like okay I stopped and I breathed for five minutes like to change their world and like it doesn't but like when we right. think about that from the perspective of it's a practice and like constantly doing it like what can actually change from it like can you speak to any of that from like what you do with your people so i will be a therapist that tells you i hate meditation personally <laughs> don't do breath work and please don't make me go to a yoga class um so She's like none of that so then yeah so then what do you do if you're not into that yeah so instead of, i am all behind mindfulness so a lot of people think when you're being mindful you have to meditate and it is very different so one of the things i tell my clients is so say somebody that feels like they're addicted to social media um, and they're playing with their child and they keep going to grab their phone. Before you grab the phone, be like WTF. What is the function? Mm. Not the curse word. Um, <laughs> like, I like that though. Okay. Am I grabbing this because like I really need to text somebody and it's important or am I uncomfortable in this moment that I need to distract myself? So if you're sitting and you're watching TV or you're sitting at home and you're working and you're getting stressed because it's so new to you to be sitting at your dining room table and you're like, I'm going to go grab a snack, what's the function? Is it to soothe the fact that you are uncomfortable or are you hungry and you want a snack? It's, it's just being mindful of why. What is the function of what you're about to do? Mm, and you can that. choose either way. 
like when you live a value-based life, sometimes you're going to go with the negative values and drink the bottle of wine and that's fine. Like that's okay. Or you're going to be like, no, I'm going to go get on my Peloton because I'm lucky enough to have one for a half hour and then I'll feel better and see where I'm at. What is the function of what you're doing and being mindful in those moments where you know that you're being activated? I mean, I know when my anxiety is starting to activate and I know if I don't catch it, and sometimes I don't, I didn't catch it last night. I went down the rabbit hole and then it's like, okay, I came down and guess what? Nothing changed. Mm. I still don't know what's going to happen. I still don't know when I'm going to be back in my office. I still don't know when I'm going to be able to get my eyebrows done. And <laughs> I, going down the rabbit hole didn't help, but it's what I needed to do in that moment. The function yeah. was maybe just getting it all out. Because I hid yeah. yesterday. Like, I went to see the guy that I was seeing, and we hunkered in his apartment, and I didn't look at my phone. Good and then you. I got home. But then I got home, and I was like, how do I catch up on everything I missed? Mm. Mm. And then before I knew it, I was like, oh, I just undid everything. <laughs> I, <laughs> but the function was, like, I needed to be in the know. What did I miss? Mm. So it's just being mindful of why you're doing what you're doing before you can even think about changing it. Yeah. That's so powerful. I love that. WTF. I'm looking at the notes. I now. love that. Like, yeah, that's so a great. Good. That's, that's our nutrition tipsy right there. WTF. That's right. Cheers What's to that. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah, I'm almost I halfway through my, my vitamin C. Yeah. <laughs> You're cheating today. <laughs> yeah. Big time. <laughs> but don't you worry. The butter Chardonnay is in the fridge for later. <laughs> I'm like counting down the hours. <laughs> I promised my little man down here a nice W-A-L-K he can't spell, so we're going to use that. <laughs> um. yeah. Well, so we, I feel like we've learned so many great tips, and again, like, thank you so much for your courage and just your vulnerability of, like, sharing everything, because I think when, when we open up and we share, like you said, it makes, it makes us human, and people realize, like, we're humans, too. Um, so how can people that are listening, how can they best find you? What's the easiest way for them to get in contact with you? Probably my Instagram. Um, it's okay. at Margaret D underscore LMFT. So that awesome. is my therapy, um, Instagram. I do post, I try to be better about it. I usually don't post over the weekends cause I try to give myself that break. Um, but I'm there. Good for you. you. DM me. My work cell is there. If you're looking to work with me, I'm in Long Island. I'm in Levittown currently privately um, or teletherapy anywhere in New York state. That's where my license allows. That's amazing. Awesome. Seriously. Awesome. Thank you for being here with us thank today. This was fun. This was I really fun. It. This is a great little time out from the day. And whenever this does air, um, I think no matter what, we'll be able to reflect on this time period and really just like think about the, the good that can come out of it. And I think that's a beautiful thing. So thank you for that perspective today. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. And I got to have wine in the middle of the day. The yes. best part of the day. We're going to take a picture next. Um, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody have a great day. Guys, thank you so much for listening and being here with us. I am virtually cheersing all of you. We absolutely love sipping on a cocktail with you and sharing as many nutrition tipsies as possible during this episode. We know there are a ton of pods out there, and we are so appreciative of your time that you spent listening to us today. Please be sure to check out the show notes for episode details and all of our guest information. We promise to keep bringing you the best and the most knowledgeable and fun guests we possibly can. Please be sure to subscribe, like, share, and post if you enjoyed our content today. And visit us on Instagram and Facebook at Drunk Dietitians to find out what is up next for us on the pod. We absolutely love you. We appreciate you and can't wait to spend more time cheersing with you soon.